make a start um, and people can sort of filter in um, over the next few five minutes. So guys, this is our first past lecture. Thank you all for coming. Um, our first speaker is Mr. Kenya. Um, basically, every, every week we're going to be doing a, a lecture, um, get a speaker in. Um, as, as today's Ken, Mr. Ken's from the other side of the world, so this is a, a great opportunity. Um, Jubilee, if you'd just like to say a few words about Ken. Um, yeah, it's our pleasure to um, introduce Ken, who is here all the way from Australia. Um, there's an 11 hour difference between us right now. Um, but it's so great to be able to have like the technology to um, hear from such amazing people from so far away. Um, so Ken is a Malaysian born architect um, and he has his practice Mara and Ye with his wife who is from Argentina. Um, and their practice started in the US um, which was then relocated to Australia in 2005. Um, and now they have projects in Sydney and Asia Pacific region. Um, and they also work with people in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, and Ken wanted me to tell you guys that, <laughs> that um, he likes to be um, lighthearted and easygoing um, and have fun because it is a serious profession but um, like they don't like to take it too seriously in a sense. Um, and today he's going to be talking about his project in Sabah, Malaysia, called Shelter at Rainforest. Alrighty. Um, can everyone hear me? Let's see. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah. Yes, um, trying to get feedback. Alrighty. Okay. Yes. Hello. My name is Ken. I currently uh, live in uh, in Australia. I am on a plane every six to eight to nine weeks through Asia, mainly Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, of course, currently I'm not on the plane. So currently I am teaching at Sydney University. I'm teaching a studio, which all of you are, most of you guys are in. And so Diksha approached me to give this lecture. And so our firm, Mara and Ye, we do, um, we've done work everywhere, um, uh, but we've got an opportunity to actually um, basically do a project in Borneo. And Borneo is an island in Southeast Asia. It has four countries share this island, um, mainly Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. I think that's it. I'm sorry, it's three. Okay, so let me start. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, so this is where Borneo is located. Okay, and this state is the state of Sabah and this is where our project is. Our project is actually a, we were tasked with building an entire village um, for a reforestation company. Okay. So, however, most, most people in the West will not know very much about Borneo. Uh, my father-in-law knew about Borneo because of this guy. And he is uh, Emilio Salgari, uh, created a legendary cartoon character called the Tigre, the Tiger of Mumprasem. Okay. And the pirate is a famous pirate and his name was uh, Sandokan. Okay. And so Emilio Salgari was an Italian cartoonist. Here is a, a very, very old uh, etching done by an anthropologist and an adventurer uh, a British adventurer by the name of Henry Lingroth. He kept precise records of North Borneo. Um, these were usually funded by the British government uh, to learn about the place. And basically in order for the East India Company to 
exploit the place systematically. But beyond that, what what we what really intrigued us about this uh, particular etching was this this really really long uh, thin uh, piles that held up their their homes. Okay, and because Henry was a proper scientist, he wouldn't draw fiction into his drawings. Uh, his drawings were mainly like photographs of today. So this really, really intrigued us. And we were like, wow, uh, you know, structures don't hold up like that. So, and like Henry uh, Roth, we also started a project as uh, keen observers. So we were given uh, four wheel drives and we drove around Borneo for for weeks, okay, um, just looking for vernacular architecture. And in this case, it's the Rungu's house, which is a, an indigenous people located uh, right on the north of Borneo. And as you can uh, see from this uh, particular sighting of their house, their homes, it actually sits atop a ridge, or, and that ridge can be man-made or the ridge can be natural, but they always sit it atop a ridge, okay? And the reason is because they want to capture the prevailing winds that actually uh, come and explode off right into their homes. And what we discovered uh, with the Rungus homes was that their walls, the, the angles of their walls, actually correlated with the winter and summer solstice. And this prevented the harsh tropical sun from ever uh, penetrating the house. So through trial and error, they, they have actually figured out where the summer and the winter solstices are and actually built their homes based off on the sun paths. So we also discovered that it is in the interior, they have these tilted battens, right? Again, it's uh, so that the sun doesn't enter, but the other benefit of these battens were that it allowed for glare control. Uh, the other thing that we, we discovered were they split up the floors again to have accelerated wind coming from underneath between the floors into the center of the building. So again, because of the high humidity in the tropics, uh, air movement is crucial uh, for thermal comfort. So you can see that they have strategically located the hammocks okay, next to where the wind comes off the ridge and explodes into the house. So wherever, where they are relaxing, they have this constant wind that's coming and basically keeping them cool. They, also elevated seats from the ground. And this is in order for them to have, uh, again, increased ventilation, but also surveillance. So what was opportune was our, our diagnosis of this vernacular. We found that uh, it was gonna be very, very difficult if you decided that you as an architect uh, could be could actually better these guys because these guys um, have really done it. So, um, so often when we start a project, we find the best possible team. I was talking to Jubilee, one of your classmates, uh, prior to this um, lecture, and we talked about a structural engineer who did the I360 in Brighton. And that same engineer, Professor Max Irvine, is also our engineer for this structure. Uh, the other important person in our team is Dr. Francis Ng. Dr. Francis Ng is a botanist. He also has won the Nobel Prize of Tropical Botany, which is called the David Fairchild Prize in Florida. And that's me. And we also have a Professor Yao Su Chao, who is an anthropologist. And when Professor Yao was a young man, he was actually sent to the jungles of Borneo to uh, look at villages uh, whilst they were building a dam there. So again, right, finding the 
right people to, with the right experience is really, really important in the success of our, our projects. And then that's my partner, Kara Mara, and she follows me everywhere. Okay, so in this project, Francis's job was, in our opinion, the most important uh, because his job was to impart to the cadet foresters, which are the young foresters that are currently in training, his knowledge and expertise. Okay, um, uh, this particular quote, I think, reflects um, what we feel deeply as to um, the work we are doing and specifically the work we are doing uh, that is part of a reforestation project like this. And as you, I'm, I'm just gonna read the quote really quickly, okay. The cultural cycle is an unending conversation between old people and young people. Assuring the survival of local memory, which has, as long as it remains local, the greatest practical urgency and value. This is what is meant and is all that is meant by sustainability. The fertility cycle turns by the laws of nature. The cultural cycle turns on affection. So to be doing this kind of work, um, the really important thing is that you have to really love what you're doing. Uh, or else it doesn't work. So every project uh, has multiple clients. Uh, this little fella was basically our most important client okay, in this project. Unfortunately, this is where he lives, okay, or he lived. This is a temporary logging camp built 50 years ago. No electricity, water, or sewer services. Um, so this is basically how most people in logging camps in North Borneo live, uh, which is really unfortunate. So we then set up to understand what our clients' logging operations were. And this was really important for us because what was happening was their logging system was being uh, changed to comply with our Forest Stewardship Council certification system. This certificate allows our client to actually sell wood to Europe and North America. Without FSC certification, all this wood would, would be deemed illegal. So it was, it was quite a big operation. Uh, it's about 100,000 hectares, which is probably you know, size of South England. This first building was a manager's house and guest accommodation. The location is up a steep hill from the river. If you remember from the Rungus uh, vernacular example, they always put the building right next to a steep bridge. And so again, we mimicked them and we made sure that we understood what they were doing so that what we were doing somewhat has a basis in wisdom. And again, by situating it here, we basically allowed the wind to actually flow through the house. This is the plan. Uh, it has two symmetrical halves divided by a wind tunnel. So this, this symmetric half and that symmetric half and that's the wind tunnel. So the plan is designed around a plywood module, not unlike tra traditional Japanese houses and their tatami modules. Okay, so every piece is a plywood module. Okay, every piece. This is the entry, which is also a wind tunnel. And this entry basically induces a uh, venturi effect basically accelerating the airflow through the entire building. This is the section of the building. As you can see, it's quite thin. These yellow lines, this one and that one, again, is the winter and the summer solstice. Okay. Again, we've decided that the penetration of sunlight into the space 
basically heats it up. So here we are preventing it from doing that. These blue dots, these blue dots are basically um, ventilation paths. Uh, basically the ventilation comes up from the ridge, pops underneath the, the floor, which has slits in it, and then pops out, okay? And similarly from left to right. So in, in the jungles of Borneo, you basically, you can't find any craftsperson. Uh, and because you can't find any craftsperson, uh, you can't find a builder that can read drawings. So whatever drawings you do on paper or graphic, it's, it's not going to work. So we basically built a big, a giant model. And basically this giant model facilitates the translation of construction drawings into real buildings. The terrain is uh, extremely slippery and dangerous. Um, it's, it becomes mud every evening because it rains every evening. And has been this part of the world has been actually used for serious adventure rallying in the past. Like this one. This used to be a very, very big adventure uh, rallying site. The weather, again, was extremely challenging with heavy rains for weeks. The tools available to us were primitive. We had to get creative with whatever we had. For example, here is an orange jack. This is a jack to jack up a car, okay? And we're basically using it to camber a piece of wood, a piece of wood to, and a beam before we fix it, fix it onto the building. So the building sits amongst uh, large jungle trees and next to the ridge of a hill. This is the main interior hall. By splitting the roof into two, we have enabled sunlight to bounce off the, the roof and into the space, thereby creating a daylighted experience. Note also that the slits on the floor slits as well as that is a excuse me 5.5 meter span on a 50 by a 100 millimeter piece of wood so the quality of the wood the tropical hardwood in Borneo is exceptional and uncomparable anywhere in the world So in the event of high winds, which we are basically experiencing more and more, the roof acts like wings of an airplane, okay? So basically the, the leeward side of the roof is going to be sucked into the air and basically sucked away from the building. To prevent this from happening, we have to understand the flexural strength of the wood, okay? And we had to anchor both pieces of wood together. What this allowed us it to do is that during a high wind situation, both pieces of wood are going to oscillate amongst each other. Okay, and this this oscillation and this dynamic loading on the roof basically saves the roof from being sucked in, sucked up uh, by the wind. Here is the detail um, of us affixing one roof to the other. So in our practice, we believe that detailing has to be done with the utmost simplicity, basically trying to use the least amount of material to do the most amount of work that's necessary. In this case, it's a tension rod. So one can look through the entire building depending on the location of the sliding doors. This allows for through ventilation, which is crucial in tropical um, weather. The entire building is made out of only three wooden components. A 50 by 50 millimeter poles, 50 by 100 millimeter poles, 
and a 1200 by 2400 millimeter plywood sheets. This includes all built-in furniture as in the case of these shelves, which are derivatives of the plywood sheets. So there, there's basically zero wastage. Structurally, we wanted to learn from the observations of Henry Roth, which showed the indigenous peoples and how they could make really, really thin piles to hold up their, their buildings. This is not dissimilar from the concept of a ballerina stiffening her core muscles in order to stand on her toes. So this, these are like stiffening your core, then you can stand on your toes. The experience of the house, uh, especially in the veranda, is that of sitting high up within the canopy amongst the rainforest trees. And here we are enjoying the atmosphere of the highland tropical rainforest. This diagram, this diagram shows the systems we deployed. Um, basically, rainwater um, is collected from the roof. So the rainwater hits the roof, gets collected on elevated uh, water tanks. That elevated water tank, gravity feeds a sink. The gray water produced by the sink is basically flushed into a ginger uh, with ginger plants to clean it. That water is also flushed in uh, basically creating uh, black water. That black water is then piped into a biogas uh, plant. That biogas plant produces methane gas. Methane gas is then basically uh, piped into the kitchen and used as cooking or, uh, cooking gas. The waste from the methanization process is then pumped into a, uh, a small farm right next to the house. So as an architect, you never really know the reaction of the final users to your building. We decided to introduce the building to some kids from the logging village and subconsciously they congregated in the corner of the building where the two benches meet amongst the large trees. This for us was a very satisfying moment. Here is how the building sits in the rainforest. So um, what I would like to conclude with is actually a a quote from Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry is an environmentalist. Uh, I believe he lives in Kentucky in the US. And he succinctly, um, basically in this quote, um, he has succinctly put it in um, a very beautiful way as to why we have to do, we as architects and environmentalists have to do this kind of work because this kind of work is uh, basically the future. As, as you know, deforestation happens quite quickly in Southeast Asia. Um, and we as Mara and Ye, team Mara and Ye, we have been very, very privileged to actually do this kind of work. But this kind of work comes with uh, a long history and uh, a very deep philosophy as to the caring of our forests and jungles. Okay. I, what time is it? Okay, so, so yes, I, I will not read this. I will end with, okay, and I will end here. Okay, uh, Diksha or Ben, I have ended. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat and Ken can answer for you. Can I see the chat? Oh, yeah, I can. I can.
So um, shall I just read up the questions? Is that how, how we're going to do it? Uh, yeah, answer them however, however you'd like. I think there's two, okay. two in there. Okay, so Muhammad Faizuddin bin Faizul, who is probably from Malaysia, asked uh, for bamboo walls in the longhouse you shown earlier, what does it help in controlling? Uh, it's not bamboo, it's, it's uh, timber, even in the Rungu's houses. It's actually controlling glare. So as you would know that in the tropics, the sun is quite intense and there is a lot of glare. So by basically putting uh, pieces of wood together, close together, you actually reduce it. What is the, the next one is, what is the lifespan of one of these types of buildings? Um, so it has to do with uh, how you design the building. Uh, it has to do with the quality of the materials you have. So we have very, 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 very good uh, tropical hardwood in North Borneo. So those woods will outlast, you know, will, will last 150 years, not a problem. And if you have a roof that can protect the wooden parts of the house, like, like we have, and can protect from high winds, uh, you know, maybe 100, 150 years uh, plus, plus or so. Did you host any community meetings with the locals to discuss the building project? Yes. So yes, um, one of the reasons uh, why I decided to form the team with an anthropologist as part of the team is that I know if me as a Western educated architect goes to the tribes and try to have community meetings with them, I'm going to have so many blind spots, I don't know what I'm actually looking at or whatever words they use, I may not be able to understand it. So we, we basically have with us an anthropologist to help translate and to help us see what we are not seeing. So I think one of the greatest things you can learn as an architect is to actually be aware of your own blind spots. And once you are aware of your own blind spots, then you can go and look for experts that have this experience to actually help you uh, look for it. So yes, to do, to do this kind of work, you actually have to spend quite a bit of time with the tribes. And, you know, the, they are very, very um, easygoing people. They are very fun-loving people. Uh, they have an amazing sense of humor. So if, if they don't know you well, they might take you to the jungle and they, you go around in circles with them. And you think that you're going very far, but they're actually taking you for for you know, a loop just to make fun of you. So it's, it's actually um, really fun people. But having said that, they are also the last tribes in the world to uh, headhunt. So the last time they headhunted was in World War II when they headhunted Japanese soldiers. Okay. Um, What do you think young architects should begin to bring to the profession? Well, ah, hi Ken, thank you so much for the lecture. In your experience, what do you think young architects should begin to bring to the profession? I think you should begin to bring wisdom uh, to the profession. And this pursuit of wisdom starts when you are a student. Uh, as you can see, uh, around you, uh, especially in the realm of politics. Adults are not really adults because, you know, a lot of times they don't pursue wisdom. So if there is one thing that I can tell you that you can bring to our profession, I think it's the pursuit of wisdom. That's for Daniel. That you travel to Singapore, I want to ask if it's a hard somebody wants to have a placement in Singapore and ask if it's hard oh I don't know um, probably um, but you probably learn a lot uh, so as you might know in Asia and most of Asia um, labor laws are not 
very mature, which means that you as an intern student probably will be overworked and underpaid. As long as you're ready for that, I think it's fine. My personal opinion or the opinion of Mara and Ye Architects is that we shouldn't be abusing young intern students, but that happens a lot and it happens a lot in Asia or all, all throughout Asia. And I'm sure it happens in London and it happens in Sydney, right? So I think there is, there is an organization called the Architectural League in New York that is trying to lobby for uh, labor rights for all architects all over the world. So you might want to check that out. Okay. Matthew Wong, Sabah is a tropical country. So what design elements do you take to measure when designing this structure in terms of ventilation, insulation, and structurally. Obviously, Matthew did not hear the lecture, but anyways, I'll just repeat. Okay, so in terms of ventilation, you have to understand fluid dynamics. So I think, and since this most everyone here are students and I teach students, I think a really, really good resource is to look at Victor Oge's um, design with nature. It's a book that was originally published in 1963 and it's been republished in 2015. So, uh, and he has a lot of smoke diagrams in there that teaches you how to intuitively understand fluid dynamics. Okay, so that's with the ventilation. In terms of insulation, I think what's most important in the tropics is actually uh, the getting rid of radiation which is probably 70, 80% of the heat component. And you use uh, isolation to do that, okay? You generally do not need insulation, um, but if, and if there are any insulation that you need, it's probably sound insulation because when it rains and you have a thin roof, uh, that's gonna sound structurally well. You, you, you have to have seen the hire a really seriously good structural engineer. Okay. What is the name of practice? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks for answering that, Diksha. Okay, let me go back and see if there are any more questions. Okay, Elena says, thank you for your presentation. It's really encouraging seeing architects that are not afraid of using less technology to build and care so much about people and their needs. Okay, so I would like to say one thing about uh, less technology. So for us, it's not about using less technology. It's actually about using the most appropriate technology. So I have another tech, another lecture on technology, but in these homes, uh, we would not be able to actually implement them if we did not use uh, really super high precision technology, which comes from Japan, which is uh, somebody in Japan invented a really special kind of screw that allows us to screw into super hard tropical hardwood without cracking the wood. And, you know, we, we owe the the scientists and the researchers that toil slavishly in their labs to come up with this technology and never and they never get any credit. So I would credit them, uh, this particular screw manufacturer and their researchers for actually coming up with the technology. So so my my answer to Eleanor is not less technology, not more technology, but most appropriate technology. Is, is probably the, the philosophy that we go by. Ben Rowe, do you have a favorite book or novel? Wow, I do. There are many, I read a lot. <laughs> ah, well, um, Reese, oh wow, favorite book. Or novel. No, I, I don't have a favorite book or novel because I have too many, uh, but I would say, uh, Probably reading Borges. Borges is pretty good. Jorge uh, Luis Borges. Um, I like, yeah. Yeah, just read everything by Borges. 
Jacqueline Deverell, what got you interested in architecture? Okay, my parents, being Asian parents, uh, decided that my, my preference of study was not important. I wanted to be a naval architect. I wanted to design boats. So they decided that I should not do naval architecture because they decided that there is no, there is no future in designing belly buttons. So they decided that I should do architecture school and that's how I got in there. What's your advice to us as students of architecture? What is your main thing you learn during your studies? Okay, my advice is to find the best possible group of very committed professors and spend a lot of time with them. So one of the professors that me and my wife got to know well when we were studying in Texas was actually an English professor from Oxford by the name of Simon Atkinson, who used to be the protege of a famous British urbanist by the name of Gordon Cullen. I also got to know a really good German professor, Gerlinde Leiding, who basically took me under her wings. So architecture is a field, it's, it's an atelier field where you learn from masters. You, you can't just read a textbook or you can't attend the lecture. So you, you actually have to shadow someone to actually learn architecture well. And I think that would be the biggest advice I can give you. Yeah. What is the main thing you learn from your studies? Um, that I basically don't know a lot about the world. I came to the conclusion during my studies that I don't know a lot from the world, even after I graduated. And I, I think that helped me. No more questions? It is, is it important to have a specific approach to the design brief? Yes. It is very important to have a, an, an approach to the design brief. However, um, the most important thing with design briefs is to not to trust them because the people usually making design briefs have not gone down on the ground and actually done a proper diagnosis of the situation to actually come up with a design brief. So my approach to design briefs is to not trust them and to basically do your own homework and diagnosis as to the situation. And sometimes you get into a situation where the solution is actually not a building. And you as an architect must be brave enough to say, hold on, what you need here is not a building. What you need here is something else. Okay. So that's my question, my answer to Diksha. Hi, Jubilee. Hi, thank you so much for um, giving this lecture to us. It, it's been so amazing hearing from you and your project. It's really inspiring. Um, yeah, if we have no other questions, I guess we can finish off here. Excellent. Okay, you guys have a good day. Thank I'm you so silent. much for your time. Thank you, no Ken. Worries. Thank yes. you. Thank you, man. Make, make us all proud, proud because you guys are the future of architecture. Oh, uh, thank I'll you. I'll try my best. <laughs> Cheers, Ken. Cheers. Brilliant. See thank you, you so much. All the best. Sorry, guys, bye -bye. for the technical issues as well.